We kicked off the year with Brexit as the main agenda. Theresa May had a majority, um, halcyon days for many Tory MPs now. And it looked like it was going to be a difficult process to get Brexit through still, but one that she could do. But as time went on, she began to become suspicious of saboteurs and decided that the only way she could really ensure the type of Brexit she wanted and the will of the people was to call a snap election. Um, this took a lot of people by surprise most people in the lobby and most of her party because she didn't tell anyone. We all know how that ended up and what happened and in a way it went disastrously wrong for her but at the time it obviously looked like she was going to walk away with this you know, landslide victory and a majority of over 100. The point in that campaign when it really seemed to turn for her was not at the beginning when she did have this kind of 20 point lead um, but there were some decisions that people didn't like the fact that she was dodging the debates. Um, but it was when this manifesto came out, and the manifesto was one which told us the five giant challenges facing Britain, but it didn't really tell us the five giant solutions. And then things turned, and we saw on election night that exit poll come in, and all these conservative parties, victory parties, I think there was one at the Carlton Club, um, where all the Tory grandees had gathered to you know, bring in this, this new dawn, and they saw that actually we were heading towards a hung parliament. And the days after that, um, Jeremy Corbyn kept saying, and his whole team, even to this day, some of them still say, we're about to have a Labour government. I think some people say Labour had won. Um, in a way they did, but actually I think this was an election where no one won. And now since the election we're probably back to Brexit, which looks even harder for the government to get free now with no majority. And I think that's probably going to be the big theme of next year um, and probably many more years to come. Just to go back a, a little further than two, 2017, in 2016 uh, I, I wrote a piece, a very popular piece for, for the New Statesman, uh, which was headlined, Calm Down Everyone. Trump is not going to be president, and we're not going to Brexit. <laughs> so you can treat my predictions that as, uh, you know, I think it's called contra-indicators. Like, wh whatever I say, you, you know, raise your confidence that the, the opposite is going to happen. For most of my kind of, like, lifetime, a pretty good rule of thumb has been that uh, people vote on, in terms of, like, national prosperity and, and, and sort of um, uh, safety first. Right? Um, and so we'll usually vote for the, for, for the least uh, risky option. And we'll usually vote, at least, you know, we'll vote for a story that we tell ourselves, which is, um, this is good for the nation, um, and it's good for me. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to vote for uh, Bill Clinton, um, or Obama, or, or you know, New Labour, or whatever. Um, and I think what happened with, with Trump was a, there's a kind of uh, a, a juncture point where he was the first real president, first presidential candidate uh, to really uh, put all that to one side and say, this isn't about a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, this is, as, in politics is a zero-sum game. There are winners and there are losers. I'm with you guys and I'm not with those guys. And for us to win, those guys have to lose. So people who have been slighted, who feel they've been overlooked and made to feel small, um, are prepared to vote for a guy that they know is uh, incompetent, um, you know, corrupt, um, really in lots of ways, are completely ill-suited to, to be president because he speaks to them and he says, I'm going to raise you up, you guys. And that means taking these guys down. Um, and that's a very, very, very powerful message, actually. It's very difficult to, to resist. And um, particularly if you, you know, genuinely have been overlooked by a lot of the political establishment. Okay, so his voters uh, elect him. It's sort of by an accident he becomes president, right? It's kind of, kind of constitutional um, accident. But now he's there. Have our worst fears been realized? No. Is it awful? Yes, it is. Um, but is he uh, uh, going to overthrow the US Constitution and institute a fascist um, a di dictatorship? No. The, the Republic is not ending, and I don't think it's going to end in, in, anytime soon. When thinking about this year, I think We've seen really clearly how power is systematically being abused, and I think the violent outcomes of that. It does prompt the question of how we actually achieve tangible change, as opposed to just surface shift. So if we're able to identify these massive issues in our society, what do we do about them? It's six months since Grenfell um, happened. 
where at least 71 people were killed. Still, there are families without homes, still families living in hotel rooms. The psychological impacts of this are going to last a lifetime for some people who were in that tower. Um, and I think residents are certainly still lacking justice, and I don't see that being resolved anytime soon. I hope that I'm wrong about that. People in Grenfell were killed by a mix of austerity, outsourcing and deregula deregulation. What we could also consider in this mix is that the voices of the poor and marginalised have been systematically devalued. So it's no coincidence that the people who were living in this tower were predominantly working class people, largely people of colour, largely migrants. So here I think we need to talk about the intersection of class with the economy, with race and with migration. What is really, really astonishing is so far it has not had a huge significant impact on political life. To better understand why, uh, why this hasn't, I think hasn't taken root maybe in the way that we might have thought, we can, I think we can look to the Paradise Papers, um, which is this massive leak of financial documents that showed the extent that the super rich use offshore finance. And the fact that this is legal behavior, I really think shows what is ultimately the rotten nature of our democracy. So trying to knit this together with what's happened with the Me Too hashtag, I think adds another dimension to this picture when we're thinking about power and how power operates. I think there's an underlying assumption in some circles that people like Weinstein are monsters. When in actual fact, he represents the extreme in part because of his power and wealth, the extreme end of a misogynistic norm. We have to see this behavior as a product of society and how our society is currently set up to function now, not as an aberration. And I think the same would be say, should be said for Grenfell. It's a horrific event, but seeing it as an aberration really ignores how it's the outcome of processes of demonization, wealth accumulation, and crucially, obviously an entirely broken housing market. So I think that when we're looking at how power operates, we, can, we have some um, immediate responses to that. But I actually think there are much deeper, bigger questions and potential um, answers that we should be considering when we're looking at this picture.